obviously all this humanitarian stuff's nice, but there are operations going on. So let's talk mm-hmm. about how how Red Wings came about. We can talk through that a little bit and then go into how that went into Whalers because these are supposed to be right. like one operation to set the conditions for the second operation, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. Right, yeah. So Ahmad Shah was a guy who, um, you know, he was – uh, he was he was not on anybody's radar. Like as as recently as the fall of two thousand four, nobody really even knew who he was. But he started. He was aligned with Hig, Hezbi Islami, uh, Gubadin. Uh, I'm not pronouncing this guy's name right, but Gubadin Hikmatier is a notorious troublemaker who's been making trouble since the nineteen late nineteen sixties, early nineteen seventies in Afghanistan, and he had set up shop in in Peshawar, Pakistan, but he, um, you know, he was aligned with the Taliban and this guy, Ahmad Shah, was aligned with him. So he was, by extension, aligned with the Taliban. He's also aligned with Al-Qaeda. And he, you know, he wanted to make a name for himself in the Pesh, Pesh Valley region. And he started doing that primarily with improvised explosive device attacks, IED attacks. He was based in part at, uh, out of Chichal, uh, which is in the upper Cornwall Valley. And he, um, you know, part of this nation building, part of this paving the way for the national parliamentary elections in September 2005 was to eradicate these types of cells. And so that's how Operation Red Wings, that was part of Operation Red Wings, was to find uh, find and locate this guy and and get him to stop doing it. You know, preferably saying, right, you're not going to do it anymore because three three had really good uh, lineage of success in those regards, just by maintaining presence in the Corongo Valley. They had one guy, um, Naj Mudin. He was a much bigger target, way bigger fish to fry than than Ahmad Shah had ever been. He just came out and said, "I give up." There was no firefight. He just said, "I give up. I'm not. I'm not. I'm done." It was like February of 2005. So I think that was Operation Celtics, or um, I can't remember the specific name of that operation. But, uh, you know, Red Wings was developed. Uh, 3-3, they kept pushing it back. There actually, It was actually initially called STARS, named after a, a basketball team, um, uh, the uh, Dallas Stars, I believe, is a basketball team. Uh, and so that that name got switched around. Like Red Wings uh, it got the, the operation got pushed back. Got pushed back because Ahmad Shah wasn't going to be around. Uh, two three showed up. Commands at the uh, various special operations commands had changed over in that time frame as well. And you know, they wanted they needed helicopter support because for that component of the operation of finding Ahmad Shah specifically and going after him. They were they were going to have a sniper team plus up six guys total, uh, extra saw gunner and a mortarman. They're going to walk in from Waterpour. It's going to be about six and a half miles, and then they were going to need to have Marines brought in by helicopter for outer and inner cordon, and then go in. and It wasn't necessarily developed to be like a hard hit raid, but it was that was going to be something that was certainly plan for if they needed to be kinetic about it to be shooting stuff and shooting people um but they you know the plan was to have an hour record and inner cordon and get eyes on with the sniper team uh but you know as i explained in victory point it's been sometimes since i've looked at this the specifics of this so i may miss a few points here it's you know, i wrote that book 15 years ago um and um but to get the helicopter support that they wanted, there's an individual at the they, they, they the helicopter support that they they wanted was 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, Army Special Operations Aviation. Exceptional pilots, all of Army Aviation, I should say, is they're all exceptionally talented, exceptionally well skilled. They all trained to the same high standards, including this, you know, everybody from National Guard, Reserve to 160th. All Army pilots are trained to very high standards. 160th, they specialize in certain types of operations, and they specialize in nighttime, very low illumination, very low illumination operations. 
Um, the conventional aviation at the time didn't, they weren't, they weren't going to support this due to the elimination restrictions. So battalions saw 160 as support. Who was, they were owned at the time by a JSOC component. And this individual uh, who was a commander of Naval Special Warfare Development Group, um, he uh, said, well, you can't have that unless Navy SEALs are involved. So that's that's how that evolved. So the Navy SEALs got involved. That plan where you're going to have six guys walk in, uh, that got nixed. They're going to have SEALs come in, uh, be dropped in by helicopter. You know, the initial plan, once they have eyes on and they're going to drop in like a company's worth of Marines, okay, you're going to hear them coming, but then it's a company's worth. The, the battle space is shaped through, you know, ISR that was provided by, would have been provided by Ronin, the uh, sniper team. And um, so they would have had exceptional situational awareness of what was going on and they would have been able to help guide the helicopters in and, you know, outline, you know, what which, which LZs are going to use that they already got uh, some good predator feeds, some good predator imagery to, to uh, identify LZs. But it was, um, you know, that, that those plans were nixed. So the Navy SEALs came in and they had their own plans and uh, we all know how they went. Didn't go well. Yeah, so that that was the part of the book that was really, again, I said at the beginning, it was really surprising. I didn't even realize that it was a Marine mission that had yeah. uh, fluctuated into, you know, having the SEALs there until you mentioned that. Another thing I remember you mentioning in the book is that, you know, they didn't follow, once the SEAL team was brought in, uh, they didn't follow a lot of the protocols, one of which I think you had written was um, prepping the LZ, like if they were going to bring in helos, yeah. drop it in artillery Can prior. Can we take a, a quick, can we stop? I was saying, um, okay, so I was mentioning the artillery support, how there was okay. a... In oh, the prep book, the LZ. Yeah, you, the LZ. You, you mentioned in the book that there was a requirement at the time for any LZs to be used to be prepped before fire for like ones that are more out there like that one was. Yeah, they, they, would, they would either, they would at least have uh, artillery registered to those and they would have all, they would have a, they you know, had a fire support plan. You're a Marine. You know, every time you leave the wire, you've got fire support plan, medevac plan, you know, comm plan, comm windows. Uh, and the Marines did not have, you know, they did not have direct involvement in planning that component of the Navy of Operation Red Wings. That was the SEALs who planned it. However, they were able to voice their opinions and they certainly did. And they said, look, we've got this list of TRPs, target reference points, 10 digit grids for call for fire, um, the artillery battery, doghouse, and Asadabad, Fob Wright at the time, uh, it was about 19 miles, I believe, uh, from the artillery battery to Satala Sar, which 105s cannot range with regular rounds, but with rock, with wrap rounds, rocket assisted projectile rounds, they could. And wrap rounds, I don't, I'm not an artillery expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I think they're just as accurate, the same circle error probable for whatever given distance that uh, a non-rocket assisted round would, would have. I guess the, the CEP would be a little bit bigger because of the distance that is yeah. generated by that. But, but, you know, it doesn't really, it, from an angular uh, aspect, it doesn't change it. It's, it's, uh, they, they had a fire support plan like Marines always do, and they wanted to have them use it, but they didn't. They also had some considerations about communications, the radio that they took. They took a, a PRC-148 M-Biter, which is a multi-band intra-tactical -intra radio system. It's five watts. Um, it's basically a walkie-talkie. Yeah, I mean, and you can use it for SATCOM. I mean, yeah. you can, you know, like a cell phone, our cell phones are... 0.6 watt phones, you know, I mean, uh, you know, a five watt, um, you know, five watt is a fairly powerful transmitter, but it's not as powerful as a PRC 117, which is 20 watts. And I think, you know, if you, you, you were part of Anglico, right? Yeah, I was. So you were, you probably use 119 Foxtrots, 117s, Probably use 150s as well. Yeah, we uh, used uh, one, 119s kind of got phased out earlier on because they were a right, really they, older model. Right. 
Yeah, one seventeens, and then you have the one seven. You have the one seventeen Fox, and you have the one seventeen Golf. The one seventeen right. Fox is a two battery. Um, I think a twenty watt radio or something like that. Pretty heavy with the radio and batteries and stuff. And then yep. and then you have the one seventeen Golf, which is basically the exact same radio but cut in half. It only uses one battery and stuff like that. Um, I've carried both. I carried a one seventeen Fox in Afghanistan in two thousand eleven, and then I carried a one seventeen. You know what? I might have had a Fox also in 2013. I can't remember. At least a Golf. But I always carried, just for reference for people, when I went out, I would as the JTAC, I would go out with two 152s, which is like the kind of like a 148. It's a different version. It's a version. five watt. It's, just, it's, it's a better. It's, it's a better end buyer, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just a. It's just a Harris radio rather than the yeah. other one is a different brand. Um, and then I would carry the 117 and a pack on my back. You know, just in case I didn't get comms with the 148s, I could or 152s, I could jump on. The yeah, the, the 117 I've heard described as like the Cadillac. It's heavy though, and it in the in in even though they're up in the mountains, part of one of the big problems was heat. And I guess those I don't know anything about radios, but they would drop their crypto fill when they got overheated. Does that sound um, right? I, maybe I've never had that. I mean, they've dropped fill before where they lose their. For those that don't know what that is, that's uh, the crypto keeps it where we can talk to each other, but no one else can hear it. And if they hear anything, right. it'll be scrambled. It encrypts it. It's a yeah. pretty long. And, you know, it's like AES two fifty six. It's a. It's a pretty. It's a, not a, nothing's unhackable, but it's fairly. You know. No um, one in the I never had hack. issues with the one seventeen though. Not not really. No. But they the the but the Marines always carried the one seventeen. It was like yeah. That's it. You're, we're not leaving the wire without a one seventeen. It's nice to use a one forty eight. We're leaving. We're, it's just and, a small yeah. line of sight radio, you know, unless because yeah. you're not normally going to connect it to SATCOM. SATCOM is something where there's limited amount. It's, uh, right. It takes a little bit more finesse to get it to work and stuff because it's got to be, you know, angled correctly, the antenna yep. and all that stuff. And you use, can't really move yeah, around. Use, use what's called a Yagi directional antenna. And the SEALs did plan to use the 148 for SATCOM. And they had a Yagi antenna with them, a directional antenna. And, you know, in the heat of battle, they couldn't set it up because you have to be just right. You get the azimuth just right and the elevation just right. Yeah, it's a, it's a whole thing. Definitely yeah. not a good. Yeah, you can't, when just I, like, can't just like wing it. Like, yeah. okay, let me think the satellite's right there. You know, you, there's like a book, right? When you've got a, you know, what's the azimuth? What's the elevation? All that stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's pretty wild. So, yeah, like I was saying, though, so those aspects, you know, and then I think I remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pulling this from memory from reading it, you know, a decade ago. Uh, but I think you said in the book that the Marines had a QRF ready to go when the yep. mission went down. But then when everything happened, when, you know, they got compromised and stuff, that the SOCOM element told them to stand down because they were going to go in with their own SOCOM element rather than have the Marine QRF. Yeah, well... Is that correct just, or not? Yeah, they... The, nobody really knew it was it was a complete breakdown of c2 of command and control it was really a complete breakdown of c3 command control and communication okay a lot of times talk about um military operations gone wrong and they'll say well the c2 got split uh c2 broke down and really it was the c3 command mm -hmm. control and communication so the third C went down first with the team the the uh, the rns team the reconnaissance and surveillance team because they didn't bring a proper radio and they try to rely on an iridium phone. Uh, the iridium has peculiarities where it ends up being um, what you would call a half duplex system. I, I had not a 9505 alpha that they had. I had a 9555 and I was in uh, tick in the same area uh, years in 2009 wasn't really a tick it was it was just getting mortared i was at fob monte and i was trying to make a call out and the same thing happened to happen to them like they can hear you but you can't hear them and then you can hear them but they can't hear you so it's yeah. like a it's like a half duplex but they there so that that was the problem and then regarding the qrf nobody back at bagram or at jalalabad really knew what was going on they didn't know when to launch the qrf and they didn't know where exactly to launch it to they didn't know who was going to be involved. It was just mass confusion. They just didn't know what was going on. And, you know, you look at it, you take a step back from that, and you talk about unity of command, unity of effort, and they violated that from, from the start. They split the command and control 
because you know the way it worked, the Marines didn't split the sea too, involving you know to get the aviation and involving special operations, the Navy SEALs. They split the C2. They said, okay, we're, in, we're the supported uh, element uh, for, the, for phase zero and phase one, and then you're the supported element after that. So we're in charge of this, and then you're in charge of it at a certain point. You know? So that's, that's, that's a violation of unity of command. Uh, and in terms of their, their specific command and control structure, they had a, a, a you know, C, the Marines called a COC, Combat Operations Center. They call it a TAC, a, ta- a tactical operations center. Same thing, um, basically. And so they had two of them, one in Bagram, and they had one in Jalalabad, and the one in Jalalabad, uh, you know, they had elements of people at the Jalalabad Provincial Reconstruction Team waiting. They had people at JAF, Jalalabad, Air For- uh, Jalalabad Airfield. So it was just, you know, we talk about distributed operations where maneuver elements are distributed all around, but you shouldn't have distributed C2. Mm-hmm. And if you do have distributed components of C2, you should have them unified in a, in a, in a formalized construct. That does happen. I mean, all the way up to the strategic level, we've got, you know, like the president can go up in that E8 Mercury and aircraft and they call it doomsday plane or whatever. And they have it all the way down to the tactical level. The Marines, you know, they had these uh, MRAPs. They would go one you know, one element would be over here, and the other, but they were all unified. They all were in, always in contact with one another. Uh, that was not the case uh, with Red Wings. They, uh, they didn't, it was complete. It was just a, you know, like throw it in a Cuisinart, blend it up. So nobody really knew what was going on at the, uh, at the C2, at the command level. Uh, they just didn't have any situational awareness of the RNS team whatsoever because their communication broke down because they, their, their communication plan did not involve what had been proven by operating in the area that the, the Marines knew uh, to use, which was a 117, a PRC 117. So um, the, they, they did launch a QRF, uh, but it was, it was delayed, mm-hmm. quite a bit delayed. They actually launched a series of QRFs uh, and they and really they were more attempts to to build situational awareness. And then they had uh, during one attempt they launched five MH 47s and they got in a soup of clouds because there was a thunderstorm that moved in. And there was very few people know about this, but there was almost you know there's two tragedies. Uh, there was the ambush of the four-man RNS team where three people were killed. There was the shoot down of the MH-47 Turbine 33, uh, where 16 um, special operations personnel were killed. And there was almost a third one where five MH-47s potentially, they didn't, I'm not saying that it almost happened, but it potentially could have ran into each other because they, they lost visual you know, they, they lost visual situational awareness of one another as they were flying and they had to break contact, they had to break off. So um, now in the hours after the initial tick, they finally were able to launch a QRF and that involved different elements. So the MH40, a couple of MH47s from Bachman launched uh, and then some UH-60s at Jalalabad Airfield uh, and PR, Jalalabad PRT launch. I can't remember the specifics of it. So. The, the 60s had the Marines on them and the, um, the MH-47s had SEALs. And so they raced out to Sotalasar. Uh, they left, uh, you know, there was some um, H-64s that could have come. You asked about prepping the LZ. And this is where the prep the LZ stuff really comes into play because the Apaches wanted to come in there first and prep the LZ. But the MH-47s, they just said, we're not going to wait. Um, we're just going to go in. And so they did and, you know, had the H-64 shown up and just done a couple orbits, they wouldn't even have had a shot. They would have just, you know, orbited. That's enemy SOP number one is when you have tactical aircraft guns in the sky, um, especially helicopters uh, at the time in the Apaches. And those pilots are exceptional who flew those, who, who fly those Apaches. And at the time they were, had just, just by having their presence there, they wouldn't have shot at anything. But they said, we're not waiting for you to show up. 
were going in. They went in. They did a couple turns. They took some sapphire, small arms fire. And on the second round, to come in to deploy the fast rope, the, one of our mod shots guys got a lucky shot with an RPG and shot him down. That's so crazy, man. Yep. Where where were you at during all of this? Like, how where where are you gaining like your insights and stuff like that? Um, at that time, this was in late July. I had uh, I was with Marines in the Mount Warfare Training Center, and I, I just the only the only insight I had really at that at that time was uh, what I saw in the news. Uh, and it wasn't until I got into Afghanistan and really, I really, that I really learned. And I mean, I learned by them saying, right over there, that's where this happened, right over there, while we were on a combat operation. So it was, um, you know, I showed up to Camp Blessing uh, and, you know, a couple of days later, we loaded into a CH-47 Chinook uh, there was two of them. There was Apaches overhead. There was a boar call sign uh, for an a-, 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 a-10. And uh, they prepped the LZ real good. Uh, we were going to land up on a it's TRP-12, target reference point 12, on a shoulder. Uh, actually, a really beautiful, I mean, it's really beautiful over there if you're in the mountains. Mm-hmm. It's Hindu Kush. And so they prepped the LZ by, by hitting it with the 120s. Uh, it's a great example of Marine Corps improvisation. Marines don't have 120 millimeter mortars organic. They may now, I don't know, but back then they, they had 60, 60 millimeter mortar, which is really an infantry system. Um, technically probably isn't an A1, which is, you know, you know, the indirect fire system, but 81s are great, uh, but they're nothing compared to a 120. 120 is like a little artillery, you know, yeah. it's like a football size. And so they, 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 they prepped the LZ by hitting it for about, I don't know, 15 minutes. Uh, and then the, the Chinooks came in. We loaded up. We, the Marines loaded up. And they loaded up with their, uh, their attached ASF, Afghan Security Forces, um, and loaded up all the MREs in the water. And we flew up and landed and got out while the, eight, the Apaches orbited around. And, you know, during this time, you know, after they left, um, the Apaches left and the helicopters left, you know, the Marines then had the objective to find where they had been, you know, setting, uh, doing mortar attacks against Camp Blessing. Uh, but that's when I really started learning about Operation Red Wings was by being, I mean, I wasn't right on the same mountain. I was about, it was about uh, five and a half, six miles away. So, you know, Lieutenant Kinzer, Pat, was able to point out what right over there is where this happened right over there is where that happened and i was like okay and you know i actually have a really great picture of him pointing you know he's he's scanning the distance to his acog that's the sight on an m16 they still use acogs on m6 they must I yeah think. yeah um and uh him he's like yep that's where it is right there that's where this guy you know what everything happened and so i really was able to get a lot of you know information that you wouldn't normally get yeah, it's just people who were there at the time who were maybe not looking at it directly, but they were right in that area, and so they were they were they had SA, they had really good situational awareness on what had been going on. So yeah, so these firsthand account like interviews yep. of people that were there. Did you afterwards? I know your book came out, you know, probably not too long after. Um, what would you say around 2008 time frame? I think is when your book came out. Did you ever April- use like? FOIA or anything like that to kind of pull any kind of reports or log entries or anything? Nope. No, I didn't need them. I didn't need FOIAs. Everything I needed was was handed to me. Oh, okay. So they were providing yeah. that kind of information to you as well. That's cool. Well, I got it. Oh, okay. I got it. Damn reporters embedded. See what happens. Well, no, I mean, it wasn't, it was, I didn't get any, nobody did anything that they shouldn't have done. Yeah, yeah. It was nothing like that. It was provided to me. You know, the information was provided to me. Leave it at that. I want, um, you know, it's such a crazy because, like I said, you know, earlier, your account, you know, that you got is not necessarily completely different than what you would read in Lone Survivor, but it does add a lot of context to, oh, that's why that happened, or, oh, that's why, yeah. you know, one thing or another occurred, um, which, Ever since that event, there's been so much debate, especially after the movie came out and the movie was pretty yeah. kind of ridiculous, I think. Um, 
What what are your thoughts on the debate over like the the account itself, uh, the events that happened? I mean, I don't know. You're in a weird you're in a weird position where you've put out um, some pretty interesting information about it. Well, the information I put out was accurate. It's what happened. You know, I mean, there's some things that I didn't get quite right. Uh, like what? How, how Camp Blessing got its name. You know, I said it, they were part of an ODA and he's actually a ranger. Mm. You know, a couple of things like that. But the big point, uh, some of the big points were that, okay, Ahmad Shah was the right-hand man to Osama bin Laden. Nonsense. Total, total nonsense. He had 400 guys. Absolute nonsense. He had, uh, he had eight, you know, and you, there's video of it. And people want to debate that. They say, well, they're not all in the video. Okay, got it. You know, I have the, I have all the video. I saw oh. the, you know, I actually, that's crazy because I remember before I joined the Marine Corps. So when uh, did this, this event happen in 2005, right? 2004, yep. 2005. So before I joined the Marine Corps, this is like still, I still call it early days of the internet, but it's early days of like video sharing online and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, where I, you could go, there were certain websites you could go to. I don't remember what the live leak. Live leak. I remember going on live leak because you could see this different footage that was coming from overseas in the early days of the war, and there was really nowhere nowhere else that had it. And mm. there, and I came across a video that the Taliban had made of where they were on the body of one of the seals, and they were pulling all yeah. this equipment out, pulled his foot. Man, I remember seeing that video, and this is before I had joined, and I was like, "That's so fucking crazy!" Like that kind of sat with me for a while, you know, seeing this yeah. dude, this American, you know, having all this stuff, his ID card. They showed his ID card, and then they yeah, showed they him Danny hacking D into the computer. They, yeah, they had Danny Dietz's ID card, and they were rifling through. Michael Murphy's belongings, and then they made a video. They showed them with their Sotmod M4s, with yep. their Attack 203s, and the you know the Peck, I don't know, four Alpha, whatever. And and they had their laptop. <laughs> they had the laptop with it wasn't classified information. Well, it actually was classified information on it. They booted it. They, they pulled the hard drive out and they stuck it in another computer. They did all this in Prashar. Or they had. They had a phrasalator, they had a strobe, they had all sorts of stuff that they had with them, and they got all of it. So that was a crazy but, video, though. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. Um, it was a. It was a. It was. A, it, yeah. I mean, it was an insurgent video. Um, but you were asking about some of the key elements that certain narratives um, applied to, you know, certain. You're asking about certain aspects of certain narratives, you know, victory point. No one has ever to this day identified any serious flaw with that book. You know, I, I mean, I made some minor mistakes. You know, I was very careful with all the facts and everything with that book. Uh, and I stand by it to this day that it's I'm not going to say flawless, but it's pretty close to flawless in terms of its it, it, of, of the re, of, of what happened. Now, I didn't get into specific details because nobody can, because the people who were involved in them are dead. You know, you can't say exactly what specifically happened um, with certain, you know, certain aspects. But I'll tell you one thing. It wasn't 400 people. It was eight. Have um, you received a lot of pushback because of your book? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I get death threats. Oh, no way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Death threats. People don't like it.